Again, thank you for joining us this evening. You are now attending the webinar entitled Art and U.S. Imperialism Past and Present. Our leader for this session is Maggie M. Chow, NHC Fellow 2021-2022, and the David G. Frey Associate Professor, Department of Art and Art History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I also want to note that we are joined by Martin Caver. Hey, Martin. Uh, who of Chicago, Illinois, who uh, is a member of this year's Teacher Advisory Council, who will serve as our TA for tonight's session. He'll be active in the chat, sharing thoughts and resources, and asking questions. Maggie Chow is a scholar of 18th and 19th century American art in a global context. She studies the history of globalization with particular interest in intersections of art with histories of technology, natural science, and economics. Her first book, The End of Landscape in the 19th Century America, examines the dissolution of landscape painting as a major cultural project in the late 19th century United States and argues that landscape is the genre through which American artists most urgently sought to come to terms with modernity. Chow has also written on media theory, material culture, and eco-criticism. Her recent publications include essays on the print culture of the earliest worldwide financial bubbles and the materiality of export art made in 18th century China. She is currently finishing a second book entitled Painting and the Making of American Empire. The first synthetic treatment of 19th century art and empire in the global context the project, project offers re revisionist readings of globally themed artwork. Subjects include landscapes of the tropics and Arctic, Trump Louis still, lifts, still lifes of important goods, ethnographic portraits, and genre scenes linked to tourism. The book aims to connect historic American paintings to the flows of commodities and peoples through colonial systems and infrastructures in the decades leading up to formal U.S. colonization in 1898. It's also, it also tackles the legacy of American imperialism, connecting the metropolitan Euro-American painters of the past with more racially diverse global artists of the present. The book will be published by Chicago University Press in 2024. Professor Chow received her doctorate in art history from Harvard University in 2014 and did postdoctoral work at Columbia University's Society of Fellows before coming to UNC in 2016. At UNC, she teaches the history of American art from the colonial period to the 20th century, as well as courses on the visual histories of science and economics. To our network of teachers, both nationally and internationally, and without further ado, I present to you all, Dr. Maggie Chow. We're honored to have you with us tonight, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Mike, for introducing me and for telling us all about the great programming that NHC has. Um, I am really delighted to be here with you all. Um, I was a fellow at NHC last year, and I just think the world of all of its educational programming. Um, I myself have had many memorable and influential teachers in my life. And so um, whenever I can, I want to give back a little bit, even, you know, this is a tiny thing. Um, so I'm here to talk about U.S. imperialism, both its history and its present. But I'm an art historian um, of the United States. And so I've been examining this history from an artistic perspective. So um, here's what I'm planning for today. Uh, for this evening. I want to start with some orientation on what U.S. imperialism means to scholars of the United States and, um, and talk a little bit about what art can offer us as a way of exploring this topic. We'll then move into um, examples of different types of art that I've sort of pulled out from the late 19th century, which for me is a really crucial period of expansionism. Um, then we will talk, uh, look at some comparative materials, so something that art historians love to do to compare images, and um, think about how imperialism abroad 
was related visually to what was going on in the continent. And then I'll end with a discussion of um, moving forward to the present to think about how artists now are grappling with the you know, ongoing effects of uh, imperialism and its legacies. So I always like to um, start with maps as a way to introduce this topic because it gives us a better sense of the geography and timeline of US imperialism. So I'll be focusing mainly on overseas empire today, and um, I, but I will address the connection to what was going on um, within the continental US. So this is a map of the current and the former uh, US territories. And I always start this way because I think that many of us don't actually even know what they are. Before I started this project, I was sort of, you know, uncertain myself. Um, what you can see from these maps is really just how, uh, how maritime oriented they are, you know, um, very much oh, uh, these these, I, these um, imperial, uh, imperial expansion in the US was focused on the Pacific um, and still is very much Pacific oriented, but earlier on in its history was much more Caribbean oriented as well. And we also can't forget about the Panama Canal Zone, which of course connected the, the Caribbean with the Pacific um, that the US um, had possession of um, into the 20th century. So there's a huge contrast between U.S. imperialism and European imperialism in the 19th century. It's something I always like to point out. On the right is a slide showing the British Empire at its height compared to the American Empire at its height. And you can see that, you know, whereas the British really were interested in large land masses, the U.S. was, um, well, these imperial possessions were mainly islands. The result of this is that U.S. Americans tend to actually overlook this part of national history. Um, and, you know, Americans tend to pride themselves in not having been colonizers like the British, the French, you know, other European countries. And so um, the problem is that there's this very much a misrepresentation of the history of U.S. imperialism, a misunderstanding of its relation to world history. And this is something that um, scholars in the United States, like myself, are trying really hard to rectify. Um, earlier this year, Daniel M. Navar gave a webinar as part of this series. Um, so, and I, I encourage those of you who weren't attending, do not attend that to listen to that because I'm sure, I think it dovetails really well with what I'm trying to say. So the other question that's important to think about is when expansion happened, sort of the timeline of imperialism. So the date 1898, which is when these prints were made, um, is usually cited as a key turning point when the U.S. becomes an empire. This is the date of the Spanish-American War, which led to the acquisition of former Spanish colonies, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Guam, and Cuba. It was also the year that Hawaii was annexed into the United States. Um, so there's a lot of visual culture, like these cartoons that you're seeing, that are really marking this moment triumphally as this, as this turning point, right? Um, and some of the artworks I'll be talking about are related to this moment, but not all. Uh, many are actually from the decades leading up to that. And this is important because I want us to think about empire more than just as a formal takeover of foreign countries. So empire can, imperialism can happen in a lot of different ways. So this is um, the, the blue text or the text in blue is something that I use in my own research as a definition of empire, um, an expansionist ideology that strives to establish inequalities between people, places and things of one national, racial or ethnic group and those of another. So sometimes this is called informal empire, sometimes it's called soft power, and it can involve lots of activities that are not formal military takeover. So these include commerce and trade relations, they involve building infrastructures in other places like railroads or shipping lines, they involve cultural exchange programs, even political cooperation in the form of aid, which can make other um, communities indebted to the United States. So um, if we think about empire in this more expansive way, then 
the timeline shifts so that it's a little bit earlier. So in my work, I see that date 1856 as a really pivotal point in the history of imperialism in the, of the United States because it's the year that the Guano Islands Act was passed. So this is something that's not going to be familiar to most of you. Um, the Guano Islands Act was passed by Congress during a worldwide race to harvest guano, which is seabird excrement. Um, and usually it's found on islands in the middle of the ocean. This was a highly effective fertilizer before um, there was technology to chemically produce uh, nitrogen. And in the mid 19th century, due to you know, intensive farming, um, monoculture farming, so the soil was very depleted in the United States as it was in many parts of the world. And so there was this race to harvest as much guano as possible to resolve that soil depletion problem. And so this law allowed U.S. citizens, any U.S. citizen, to take possession of an island for the United States as long as no one else claimed it as their territory. And as a result of this passing of this act, over 100 islands were claimed, uh, mostly in the Pacific, somewhere in the Caribbean, and many of them actually didn't have any guano on them. Um, some did, and infrastructures were built to harvest it. In the photo, you see um, a tramway, remnants of a tramway from uh, Jarvis Island. Today, it's still a minor outlying territory in the Pacific. And the harvesting was actually almost always done by African-American labor forces or by immigrant labor. So this really marks a big turning point as far as the United States thinking about its relations with the rest of the world. Um, and it, 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 it uh, paved the way for more serious colonization efforts around the world. So this is about the moment when I like to sort of start thinking about um, US imperialism and art. Now I wanna talk a little bit about how art figures into this history. Right. What can we learn about the history of imperialism by looking at art? Right. Um, so many people, including other scholars who are not art historians, usually see art as illustration. Right. Like this is a picture of what happens, you know. Um, so this is so I, I, I like to give this example. So this is an example of a Winslow Homer painting called Searchlight in Harbor, at the Harbor Entrance, Santiago de Cuba. And it represents an event that took place during the Spanish-American War. It's depicting in the distance, you see that searchlight beam, right? It's depicting the searchlight that was used by the US Navy in 1898 during a blockade of the Santiago de Cuba Harbor, which led to the US victory of the Spanish-American War and the handover of Cuba to the US. So people tend to look at this painting and say, oh, well, that's just an image of what happened. The problem with seeing this painting as an illustration is that Homer actually wasn't there during the Spanish-American War at all. He had been to Cuba, but years earlier as a tourist, um, it was before there were, you know, uh, colonial tensions in Cuba uh, really beginning. He, when he was a tourist there, he sketched this fortification that's in the harbor. And then in 1901, which is already three years after the war ends, there's a um, naval hearing that's taking place in the United States. And this war is in the news again. And so he decides that he's going to paint this picture because, you know, people are talking about the Spanish American War. So he's essentially taking these sketches he had made as a tourist, reimagining them in the terms of this blockade that took place. So what I want to say is that, you know, it's not accurate, right? It's not that he witnessed what happened. And it's also loaded with the artist's intentions of what he wants. So a lot of those to benefit himself at this moment when the war is again in the news. So this doesn't mean that we should, you know, we shouldn't then assume like all oh, art's inaccurate, so I look at it, right? Um, but what I want everyone to, to know and to take away perhaps is that what art is that art can teach us about the past, but not in that sort of direct way of this must be exactly what it looked like when something happened. Um, 
it can actually teach us about the past in ways that other kinds of histories can't, um, you know, military histories and economic histories. Um, so I want to do a little bit of that now. So when we think about art in relation to political histories, we sometimes have to recontextualize those works of art. So probably all of you have probably been to some kind of museum in the past. And in museums, you'll see paintings like this one. The goal of most museums um, has historically been to educate the public by showing examples of masterpieces and about artistic development. So um, a painting like this by the American artist James McNeil Whistler might be shown in a museum in a gallery sequence that looks something like this, right? This sequence is trying to teach viewers about the artistic developments of uh, from naturalism, it's a very realistic looking landscape painting, to abstraction, right, it, over time. So we have this kind of development of artistic history over time. And this isn't wrong, this isn't an inappropriate way to look at art, but what, it, what happens when we look at art this way is that it emphasizes just the formal qualities, the visual qualities of what's on that canvas, and it tends, it tends to erase the politics of what went into making these pictures. Um, so the, 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 this painting by Whistler was painted in 1866 in Valparaiso, Chile, during the Chichas Islands War, which was fought there. And the Chichas, as you see from these images, were a group of islands off the coast of Ecuador, which were especially rich in guano. You can see the, a photograph of the harvesting of that guano, how big, you know, how, how much that it was accumu had accumulated there. And so um, this is a war in which Spain was fighting against its former colonies in South America over control of these islands. And it was part of a broader attempt of Spain to reclaim some of its colonies, of its former colonies, which had become independent. Uh, and so eventually Spain actually ends up losing this war because uh, the South American countries band together to fight them off. But, you know, Whistler, um, so you might wonder like, what's Whistler got to do with this? So Whistler arrives in Valparaiso, Chile in 1866. He creates three paintings while he's there, which you see here. He's a basically this very wealthy elite artist. Um, he's a Confederate, he has Confederate sympathies. Um, his parents were from American South, but he was very wealthy and was living in Europe at the time. Before, he, before that though, he had been a student at West Point and he had been involved in coastal survey work. So he had this like connection to the Navy. So when this war begins, the US Navy actually sends ships down to Valparaiso because they're concerned about like the power dynamics of uh, this war with Spain, blockading these harbors in South America, major trading partners. Um, and so Whistler goes down there to either to sort of cheer on the U.S. Navy or to participate, perhaps to help out in some way. Um, and when he he shortly after he arrives, Spain bombards the city where he where he did, where he's got where he's just arrived, um, and so he flees along with like other for, other foreigners. But he does, you know, there are these three paintings that he makes while he's there, and these paintings are about politics. They're about empire. They're about this kind of imperial context, contest going on between various imperial powers in this period of the guano, fight for guano, fight over guano, right? Um, but it isn't really legible here, right? It's very hard to see exactly what's happening. You can see some ships in the harbor, but it, there's no conflict that's visible. And part of that has to do with the style that Whistler used, which is very, very loose. You can see kind of his brush strokes and it's not very detailed. Um, these visual qualities have to do with the fact that as an artist, Whistler believed in this artistic philosophy of art for art's sake. 
So he felt strongly that paintings should not reference anything outside of the actual picture. Um, he really wanted viewers of his art to really look at what he had all, just the brush strokes and the colors that he had put on the canvas and to think about harmony and line and um, form. Uh, he, you'll see that he often used um, uh, musical titles, like the central painting is called Nocturne in Blue and Gold. And he wanted to reference music because it was more abstract than painting. It was less representative. So the fact that Whistler wants to erase politics from his art leads him to actually invent this new kind of landscape when he's in Chile, which is called the nocturne which, uh, or the night painting. And this is a form of art, the night, the night landscape is something that Whistler uh, becomes associated with, becomes famous for. It's what you'll see of his work if you go to major museums today. But, you know, something that I like to ask myself is, well, why did he invent this form of painting when he's in Chile, witnessing this war between Spain and these former colonies, a war that's over the control of a commodity by in, um, imperial powers? I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, that he wanted to make that politics invisible. And one way of doing that was to basically, you know, paint a night view, something where, you know, you cannot actually see anything. You can't make sense of what you see. So um, he's trying to literally veil that politics in darkness. And I like to give this example because I think it's really, um, it, it, it presents this idea of unseeing politics, right? Making it invisible, which is so much a part of the U.S. experience of imperialism at the time and continues still today, right? It's embedded in these earliest pictures that have to do with uh, expansion overseas. So what we have then is this kind of the sense of innocence of being, you know, the U.S. is being apart from, different from European, what Europeans are doing. Um, we're not subjugating people, right? We're sort of not conquering huge, huge countries and so on. Um, Americans actually in the period until today, I think, see themselves as neutral parties, as benevolent saviors, right? These are... Um, so in a lot of ways, this painting is a kind of symptom of the impulses of how the U.S. relates to the idea of empire at all. Um, before I go on to uh, share, you know, go into uh, some more, introduce some more paintings to the group, I thought I would stop in case there are questions that have come up already. Thank you so much, Dr. Chow. Uh, there's one question we had from Carl. Uh, it was from earlier when you were providing your definition of empire. Carl's question is, uh, why does your definition of empire prefer the phrase establish inequalities between to a phrase like establish power or control over? The definition includes uh, establish inequalities between as opposed to establish power over? It was one of the earlier questions that we had from Carl. Sure, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think both could work. Uh, you know, I, I think I used establishing inequalities mainly because um, a, I want to think about, uh, you know, make this definition expansive, but I think in establishing inequalities is to me very similar to establishing power or control over. So, you know, inequalities in a way to me implies a kind of um, inequality of power. Good deal, thank you. Uh, another question is, is uh, I find it interesting how the artists navigated political ra realities uh, through their art. And you mentioned this idea of unseen politics. And, how do you, I guess, situate that or even juxtapose that against um, the yellow journalism that uh, was pervasive during the Spanish-American War? Um, because you have two different approaches as to uh, addressing politics. On one hand, you're unseeing, but in uh, you know, popular media, there's the yellow journalism and the sensationalism which is happening. 
Yeah, it, it's, you know, I think this is um, an interesting difference between what's happening in the 1860s and then what's happening in 1898. There is a moment in 1898 when imperialism becomes the issue of the and it's really celebrated um and so artists are dealing with a different situation at that point of you know whether they want to sort of jump on the bandwagon of um creating images that celebrate imperialism or not in this earlier moment it's kind of um it's kind of more difficult. There is a lot of debate about imperialism in the media uh, concerning specific locations and spaces. And I'll talk about a little bit about that in the next section. Um, and artists were having to figure out where they stood. You know, they weren't always, um, you know, the art was not seen as necessarily political in the way that uh, we think of art as political, a very political kind of practice today. Um, so artists like Whistler, you know, still today, art historians look at Whistler, curators look at Whistler, and they think like, we don't want to talk about Whistler as a political artist, because there, he wasn't, he was concerned with art for art's sake, he was thinking about formal innovation, um, you know, and, and this idea of Whistler even caring at all or thinking at all about empire seems really out of the question. Um, so I think part of it is just changing how we look at, you know, artwork of the past. Good deal. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for answering those questions. Um, and again, I encourage everyone uh, in the audience to include any questions that you will have in the managed Q&A box. There will be uh, additional opportunities to ask questions. So if you have them, go ahead and uh, put them in the box, include them in the box, and uh, we'll bring them to Dr. Chow's attention. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so let me share uh, another landscape with you all. So landscape, you know, is in a way the most obvious imperialist genre because empire is about land often and landscape pictures offer views that imply the viewer's mastery over land. Uh, so, but it's also easy as with the Whistler example of turning these into innocent pictures. You know, we can say, oh, this is just a celebration of nature. This is just a beautiful view, right? Um, so I want us to think about how, how to see imperialism in landscape painting. This is a landscape by the most famous landscape painter of the 19th century named Frederick Church. So he made this after he and his wife traveled to Jamaica, which was then a, a British colony. And they went to Jamaica um, in 1865 during at the tail end of the Civil War. And at this point in his career, Church had already traveled to other tropical places multiple times. So he was sort of associated with the landscapes of the tropics. That was what he was famous for. And in Jamaica, he makes a lot of sketches and then he goes back to his studio in New York and he paints this painting, which is of a view from a mountain that he um, visited during his time in Jamaica. So, it's hard to, you know, what is this painting about, right? It's a view, yes, but it's hard to see like anything very clearly. There's a lot of mist in the in the surround in the area in the background. It's kind of hard to make out like what are we really seeing? What are we really trying to see? And you'll notice there's this like one bright spot in the middle, in sort of lower down in the middle of the canvas. And you'd expect like, oh, it's a bright spot. There's probably something there, but there's nothing there. So it's kind of confusing as a painting. Um, and the only thing that really, you know, uh, seems to emerge as a kind of subject that he really seemed to pay attention to or to care about are the plants. We see a lot of plants. This is a very large painting as well. Um, you know, almost like life size. Like if you go, you feel like you can go jump right into it or something. And the plants are so carefully painted that you would be able to identify the species. So he clearly cared about tropical plants. And these plants would have meant something to 19th century viewers. 
there was a huge innovation at around this time for transporting plants. So for the first time in history, there was, this, there was a, a way that you could transplant living plants around the world, thanks to this invention called the Wardian case, which looks something like that box you see on, that, on the left. So what this means is that now you can have tropical plants delivered from the tropics to anywhere in the world, put in your private greenhouse, in your botanical garden, in a terrarium in your living room. It became this huge rage to have tropical plants in your own, you know, in your domestic space. And one of the types of plants that actually became very well collected or very famously collected were ferns. Um, such as tree ferns, which is that really tall plant in, the, in that painting on the right edge is a tree fern. And uh, the tree fern was, very, was associated with Jamaica. And in fact, when Church painted that landscape, he actually painted it for a private collector who commissioned him to paint it. Um, the collector was the heiress to the Colt gun manufacturing fortune. And it's her greenhouse that you see on the right image here. And when Church finished his painting, he sent the painting over to Mrs. Colts, right? And at the same time, he, he, uh, he asked a local nursery to ship to her a tree fern directly from Jamaica. So there was this real connection between what was in the painting and these actual plants that were moving around. So we, we want to ask ourselves then, well, what did Church think of these plants that he was representing? How did he characterize the tropical plants he was painting? And we can look at some of the other paintings that he did in Jamaica, uh, some sketches. And these are paintings that he actually did while he was in Jamaica, rather than the large painting, which he did later from, you know, in his studio in New York. And what you see in these paintings, I hope, is that these tropical plants are really aggressive, that they're in the left image. He actually calls that a parasite, you know, a parasitic plant, harmful, damaging. In other words, there's this idea that tropical plants might be beautiful and ornate if you can collect them and manage them in a greenhouse, but if they're left alone in the landscape of the tropics, they'll just destroy what's all around it. And that right painting, you can see kind of almost like those plants have grown so much over what's in the foreground that you can't even tell what they're covering anymore. When I teach that big painting of Jamaica by church, I like to have students read newspaper descriptions of Jamaica during this period. And these are two examples that I'm kind of pulled quotes from. And if you look at these quotes, you see that um, one of the major concerns of American, these are American journalists to, um, to Jamaica, uh, one of their major concerns has to do with tropical plants bringing ruin to you know, the, the plantations. Um, you see that in the top quote, which talks about how there's so many deserted estates that, um, you know, hundreds of acres of land have been overgrown by weeds. And this reference to the deserted estate has to do with the history of emancipation. Jamaica is a British colony and uh, slavery ended in the British Empire in 1834. And when that happened, a lot of these uh, plantations in the Caribbean were abandoned because there were absentee planters basically and there was no more labor so these these estates were abandoned um, you can see in the lower quote uh, which talks about coffee plantations that once were productive now overgrown like a jungle so there's this real sense like church's painting of um, that you see on the right like this sense of plants just taking over out of control um, that it, without a system of enslaved labor to manage the agriculture of a plantation, you have essentially the plants are just going to ruin everything. And historically, around this time is when um, is when American entrepreneurs go begin to look at the Caribbean very seriously, particularly these colonies that were you know, had a lot of abandoned um, absentee 
landlords. And they move into Jamaica to establish other agricultural industries there, like bananas, um, and that, uh, which is still a $30 million industry in Jamaica. It's one of the top exports. So what we can see in paintings like churches, um, it, well, the way we can use them, and I think, in our teaching is to enrich our account of the history of empire. Uh, and, it, and in a way that thinks not just about the history of trade, right? Like, yeah, you can look at, you know, banana exports and how, you know, that's increased over time or something, or you can look at political history and how emancipation affected, um, affected uh, the economy of Jamaica, but you can see through paintings a different angle. You can see that actually the U.S., the way that U.S. entrepreneurs went into Jamaica, what they did was actually in a way justified in their mindsets by these observations from nature. Um, so very much on the minds of people was this idea that a tropical ecosystem was something that had to be managed, had to be controlled. So there's a message embedded, not just in the painting, but also in the way that people interacted with tropical plants, right, to keep them in greenhouses, to keep them apart. Um, and that's something that I think is still very much a part of our culture, right, the way that we understand a house plant is something that we can, you know, see as decorative and beautiful, but we don't, um, but, you know, we also imagine the tropics uh, as, you know, often as something really dangerous or something that is hard to get through, hard to move through. And the legacy of that is, you know, coming from this moment of these paintings of the tropics. So um, I want to talk next about still life painting. And still life um, is, you know, about things. And in the 19th century, there was a huge amount of global consumption of things. Um, as you can see from this painting from 1882, I marked all the various kinds of foreign goods that are represented in this painting, which is actually a, a view of, the, of a studio, an artist studio in New York City. I think this looking at still life really resonates with the present because we still consume products from all over the world, often without thinking much about it. So but when we look at still life, you know, we can do something like this, right? We can catalog, you know, what's there. Um, but we also have to look at how an object is represented um, because how it's represented says just as much as what is represented. So I want us to think about this painting, the Scott Evans homage to a parrot and how it relates to empire. So first we can talk about the subject matter, right? This is an exotic bird. This isn't something that you would see flying around the United States. This paint was painted in 1890. Um, and this was a moment in which there was a very, uh, exotic birds are very popular as pets. Um, that's something you would keep in your home. And there's a statistic that I looked at, which is that 30,000 parrots were imported into New York in a single year from Africa and South America. Uh, this is a moment, as I just talked about, where there was a lot of commercial expansion into the Caribbean and Latin America, where a lot of these birds were hunted and brought to the U.S. So this is, I should also note, you know, you, now we breed animals a lot for pet keeping, but at this time parrots were something that had not been, you know, there was, hadn't been success in breeding them. So anytime you wanted a pet, you have to, you know, capture these birds from foreign countries and bring them in. So animals like plants say a lot about imperialism. Consider, for instance, the zoo or the Natural History Museum. These are places that Americans would go to see exotic species in cages and in glass displays. And these were institutions that were all founded in the late 19th century. Um, and these types of institutions uh, allow the state, which often sponsors them, right, the country, the, the government, which, you know, will partly sponsor them, 
a way of showing their access and control over the rest of the world, right? You amass uh, a kind of Noah's Ark of all the species around the world, and then you have in miniature this sense of like dominion over those spaces. So like it's a showcasing of empire, kind of like a botanical garden also does that with plants. So this painting is, the setup of this painting reminds us of a museum case, right, in which taxidermy birds are shown with labels. Um, but the parrot, painting a parrot has particular meaning. It's really interesting to think about why an artist would paint a parrot. So parrots, of course, speak. Um, and that is exactly the, the, the characteristic of a parrot that this artist, Scott Evans, highlights in this painting. So you'll see that in the, the bottom right corner of the painting, there's a little sign. And if you zoom in on that sign, you see that it, it's a note in French, actually. And it, um, it said, what the note says in, in, in English, if I translate it, is this parrot was found in South America and from there taken to Paris where he learned to speak the French language for many years. At the age of 20, he died and was stuffed, and here he is. And, he's, and there's, a, there's a, a person who signed the notes named Pierre Gastereau. We don't know anything who that is. It's a made-up name, probably, but it's not the artist's name, and that's something we should keep in mind. So what we have here is in, is in this little, little note that's painted is this reference to the parrot learning language, right? It's acquiring language. And this idea of acquiring language, acquiring a foreign language of the colonial, of a colonial power is so central to all forms of imperialism. You know, forced assimilation includes forcing people to learn the colonizer's language. And this is in a way what's happening with this parrot because he's coming from South America, he's going to French or going to Paris, where then he's having to learn French. So now let's talk about how the bird is painted. Um, this is a style of painting that was very popular in the late 19th century United States. It's called trompe l'oeil, French for to fool the eye. And it's basically a, a kind of painting that is so hyper illusionistic so realistic, so carefully painted that it would actually trick people into trying to, you know, take things off the wall. Um, and so what the artist, the Scott Evans, is emphasizing by painting a pair in this particular style of art is his own kind of parroting, if you will. Right? He is associating, in a way, human and animal forms of mimicry. Um, trompe l'oeil in this period was actually looked down upon by the most high-end collectors of art. So those, those collectors, the very wealthy people who rule the art world, those people really like paintings that look like Whistler's landscapes, right? Very, like, sketchy and, and hard, you know, more abstract. And this is the exact opposite of that. And so those, you know, the, the sort of rulers of the art world, if you will, like to describe this kind of painting, what you see here, as a kind of dumb copying, right? Rote. Um, there's no intellectual content. This is just kind of a, a, a talent that is, that is mechanical. So in other words, it's just like the parrot is speaking, right? The parrot doesn't know what the meaning of the words it's saying are, it just repeats what it hears. So, you know, the implication is that the artist is like his subject, a kind of, you know, parroting. And, um, and there is a way in which this artist's own biography kind of links up with the story of the parrot. So he's from the Midwest, and he actually goes to Paris himself to study art. So there's a mirroring of this, you know, geographic trajectory. Um, but there's ways in which you can think about the artist's reference to this parrot journey in relation to broader questions about imperialism at this time. There were animals 
um, you know, birds and other animals were very much associated with colonized populations around the world. So if you think, for instance, still today, you go to a natural history museum and you see stuffed animals, right? But you also see cultural collections from indigenous people from around the world in that same museum. Um, at the time, there were also instances horribly of actual living individuals being living subjects, um, indigenous subjects being displayed in zoo contexts, as you see this like news article of one such instance from the early 20th century. So, um, by, so in painting this parrot, Evans is really interested in issues of empire. He's referencing all of them, right? But it's kind of hard to be sure where he stands politically. And that, in part, has to do with the lack of clarity of this style of painting in terms of, you know, where, um, in terms of the artist's intent. In trying to fool the eye, right, and trying to make this painting as illusionistic as possible, the artist has to erase his own hand. What I mean is he can't let his personal style get in the way of the illusion that he's creating. Um, and that's very characteristic of all Trump white painting. In fact, the artist doesn't even sign this work. Um, you see this little slip on the upper left that has his initials, but that's as close as you get to a signature. In fact, the only signature you see in this painting is a signature of this Pierre person who's just made up, right? So there's a politics to this picture, right? It's there, but it's also ambivalent. You know, we don't, there's a kind of lack of clarity as to, you know, how the artist feels himself. So last uh, type of painting I'll talk about is genre painting. This is meaning a scene from everyday life. And I want to focus on this watercolor by John Lafarge from 1890. So um, this is an artwork made in the context of tourism. And again, something we can relate to today because it's so easy to travel anywhere in the world. So artworks um, like this can really help us think critically about our perceptions, interactions with people of other cultures. This was a painting made in Samoa in, um, uh, during a long vacation <laughs> that Lafarge took um, along with, uh, he was traveling with Henry Adams. You see the two of them in this photograph, uh, who was a Harvard history professor. He was a very wealthy descendant of the presidential Adams family. They, had, they were engaged in this very privileged form of travel. You see the map of their itinerary up there. Um, they were meeting with ambassadors and with indigenous leaders. They were kind of thinking of themselves as these like very elite quasi diplomatic visitors wherever they went. When they get then Samoa at this time was still independent, but it was under the influence of very much under the influence of Americans as well as the Germans and the British. And only a few years later, it would become a protectorate of all of those countries. And eventually it would be divided up into Samoa and American Samoa the latter being the U.S. territory, um, still a U.S. territory. So Lafarge is there sort of on the cusp of the U.S. formally colonizing a part of Samoa. So one of the fascinations that Lafarge has uh, in Samoa is with the Siva, which is a, the, a, the Samoan term for dance, which is performed for him and Adams everywhere they go. He writes extensively in his journals about how, he, how impressed he is with the dancers' movements, about and about sort of his frustrations or not being able to capture it fully. So what's immediately should be immediately clear from this painting is that the artist is really interested in a kind of anthropological point of view. He's looking at a cultural practice that is it has this look of being part being a kind of pre contact history uh, culture. He's depicting these these two women in traditional attire. There's minimal Western influences. Um, and there's a sense that these dancers are inhabiting a time that's removed from the artist's own, right? This, this sense of, that comes out of, this idea comes out of anthropology around this time, which is that ethnographic study of uh, cultural others places them in this kind of pre-modern past as opposed to the modern present. So there's this like separation of temporality. 
And this, of course, supports colonial activities because, you know, you can see, you can either try to modernize primitive people or replace them with settlers. So it's very much wrapped up in colonialism. And we know that, um, some, that Lafarge ignores instances in which Samoans are dressed and are adopting Western attire and culture. So if you compare his image of the dancer on the left with this photo of an indigenous leader that he actually met with, um, during his visit, who portrays himself in Western clothing, you can really see the stark difference there. What you also might notice um, when you look at this painting of the dancers is the amount of detail he includes. We have a sense that these are like portrait-like um, individuals. And um, so you might ask, like, how did Lafarge make this painting? How did he get all those details if this was just a performance that he witnessed? And as you might guess, that what he had to do was have these dancers pose for him as opposed to actually, you know, seeing what was happening, you know, recording it as the dance was happening. So essentially he was freezing, asking them to, okay, freeze in this way, and then I will paint you. And this is really important because these paintings were made at a time when Americans were really invested in recording moving bodies through stop action photographs. These were made um, around the same time by, an art, by a photographer named Edward Moybridge, who was um, making these stop action images at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so you can see that these are bodies being frozen at regular intervals, right? This is a photographic technology that would then later be adopted in Taylorism and efficiency management. So there's, a, there's this impulse to stop time. It's very Western. It's associated specifically with U.S. industrial efficiency. And this is the kind of aesthetic that um, Lafarge is introducing into his pictures of uh, Samoan dancers. He's representing this cultural way of life that is not his own, yet he wants it to conform to a Western notion of time and the body. So he's freezing action in a way that um, is really uh, not representative of the way that the people he depicted understood the practices they were engaged in. So what's really missing from what Lafarge is depicting is not just movement, but also crucial to indigenous dance performances in Samoa was sound and music. Um, and without those, you really don't have the cultural form that he is uh, that he's interested in. Um, and in Samoa dance is is accompanied by chants and songs that actually tell stories about kinship and about connections to the land. And when you take those away, when you make these it, the image mute, you essentially are imposing a, a sort of way of being that is foreign, that is colonial. So um, to give you all a sense of what uh, Samoan dance would have been like, um, we can watch a very briefly a video of a uh, performance of a dance that um, by uh, diasporic performance take, that took place recently in New Zealand as part of Polyfest. Thank you. So very much you can get the sense that so much of that dance has to do with the, the sound, the rhythm, the movement of the body where, you know, then if you look after you've seen that, if you look back at the Lafarge, you feel like, wow, there's really, you know, that's almost drained of what it actually is about. Okay, so I, I can pause again for questions um, before I move on to the next section. Okay, good deal. Thank you. And I'll let everyone know that 
uh, roughly two minutes after the hour. We have about 28 minutes left. So if you have any additional questions, please feel free to insert them into the audience chat. We have one question from Lois, who remarks as to the Lafarge Siva dance uh, photo. How does Gauguin's paintings of Tahiti fit into this style? They are at the same time. Around yes, the same great. Time. Great question. Yes, they are very much at the same time. Um, Gauguin actually goes to Tahiti right after Lafarge leaves. They don't actually meet each other. Lafarge hates Gauguin's work. They aren't really, um, they aren't artistic partners in any way, right? Um, but, you know, Gauguin is a symbolist. He's really interested in these kind of um, philosophical questions. Um, Lafarge is interested in a kind of ethnographic view. So they're very different. But there's the connection between them, of course, is that they're both these white artists coming into Samoa, Tahiti, these Polynesian islands. They're um, after a kind of experience of otherness, and that motivates them, both of them. Good deal. Thank you so much for answering that uh, that question. That's 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 an interesting perspective that I'm sure some teachers will uh, go down a rabbit hole, kind of looking at that, uh, you know, the, 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 taking a look at the uh, perceived uh, relationship or lack thereof between the two. So uh, we that's the only question we have for now, and uh, okay. so we can continue to move ahead. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. So now I want to talk about. Um, uh, I've introduced, you know, a range of works in, about overseas imperialism, and I want to think a little bit about how it's connected to colonial practices in the within the United States. Um, so I want to talk about two things. One is um, uh, colonization of native lands, which was taking place during these very decades, uh, and you can see Indian removal map of Indian removal on the left and then a map of all the battles that took place between Native Americans and U.S. Army in the later half of the 19th century on the west half of the western half of the United States, which really shows how much um, the U.S. understood the expansion westward as a form of colonization of sovereign people. Um, another context I want to think about is the institution of slavery, um, because this is what connects the southern United States to the Caribbean, you know, spaces that are colonies of European colonies. And um, you can see from this 19th century map here that was made by Frederick Law Olmsted, an abolitionist, he actually calls the South the Cotton Kingdom. So very much suggesting that is, is a full kind of empire. So we can look at art being made in the continental United States and see parallels with art that was being made about uh, dis more distant places. Um, we can compare, for instance, Lafarge's view of Samoans as these um, people who seem out of time, a kind of removed from modernity, as very much connected to the way that painters depicted in, uh, indigenous North Americans at this same moment. So the painting on the left, you can see almost exactly from the same time period, <clears throat> is, shows uh, Native American weaving so again, this is an, an image of a cultural practice, right? Um, this Indian figure is not dressed in Western attire. Everything about this picture looks like it's pre-contact. And this is a moment um, when, in which an indigenous person would have seen this and felt like this was completely out of date. Um, it was not something that would have been, uh, uh, you know, at all resemble their lives in the Temporary period of the United States of 1889. And in fact, a lot of indigenous people at this time were um, performing, like, perfor you know, and essentially performing their nativeness for Western tourists in the Southwest. Um, so we can see that, you know, this, this, these kinds of paintings help to reinforce the way that white settlers were justifying their occupation of native land or an incursion in, in, incursion in places like Samoa. We can also draw some connections between plantation landscapes of the tropics and those of the American South under slavery. So the painting on the right is by a, a artist, a Southern artist named Louis Remy Mignot, who is actually one of Frederick Church's friends. They traveled together to the tropics, not to Jamaica, but on a different trip. 
Um, and this is a painting. The painting on the right is one that um, depicts an event that took place at um, Mount Vernon, Washington's plantation, about 80 years prior to when this painting was made. Um, this painting was made during the Civil War era. And you might want to guess what Mignot's sympathies were at this time. You can see that um, there are enslaved people in this painting, um, both in the foreground with the child and also in the background, it's harder to see um, on the slide probably. So Mignot was a Southerner. He was a Confederate sympathizer. He was from Charleston. He actually fled the country when the Civil War broke out. And this painting was a collaboration with this other artist named Thomas Rossiter, who was a figure painter. So Mignot did the landscape, Rossiter did the figures. And Rossiter actually published a description of this painting for viewers. Like, so they would go to the exhibition and they would, you know, read this description when they looked at the painting. And this description is really telling. And there are some quotes out of there that I um, pulled out. One is this description of Washington's Mount Vernon as an estate, uh, a small empire um, in which the planter ruled supreme over his legion of slaves. So very much this notion of Washington, not just as, you know, this polit politician and revolutionary hero, which he was, but as a, a slave owning planter. And the other thing that Rosser points out is um, how fortunate it is that this, these women, meaning this, this group of um, Confederate uh, women, um, had vowed to restore the land of Mount Vernon to, from its decay, um, from rescuing it from what he calls the wilderness of sloth and poverty. So what he's referring to is that uh, at this moment in 1859, Mount Vernon had kind of fallen into disrepair. It was kind of in ruin. He talks about how the plants have taken over. Um, and actually one of the things that Mignot does when he paints Mount Vernon is he actually regresses time. So he's painting it as it would have looked in uh, 1784, not the way it looks now. So what you, I hope you can see or you're beginning to see are the parallels between the US South and the Caribbean tropics that are kind of you know, in the imagination of Americans at this time. So both these spaces are, uh, you know, plantation-based economies um, where forced labor is required to maintain productivity. You know, without slavery, there's a sense that both of these spaces will fall into ruin, that there'll be these plants that will take over. Uh, and the U.S. South has actual links to the tropics. So in the aftermath of the Civil War, Confederate landowners now with uh, after emancipation are sensing that their way of life is, you know, out is not no longer possible. And one of the things they do is they seriously pursue colonial projects in the tropics. Um, they develop schemes to colonize parts of Mexico and of Brazil. Thousands of Confederates actually settle in Brazil because slavery is so legal there. And there are enclaves still today um, that celebrate the culture of the old south and this is a photo from one of those plate one of those um, one of those towns um, so that's uh, so I'm gonna um, instead of pausing here I will go on to the next section about um, contemporary art and then at the end there will be time for more questions so the last topic of the evening is the legacy of US imperialism and brings us to the present. And I want to introduce some contemporary artists that, um, and the ways that they've confronted this history that I've been outlining for you. So I like to, I always think of imperialism as something that's ongoing. You know, even if places that had been colonized are now independent or have gained statehood, as is the case of um, places like Hawaii and Alaska, um, the effects of imperialism are not, they do not stop when the status of the, that, that place changes. So I really like to pair contemporary art and historic art because they speak to each other um, in really generative ways. So let's start with this comparison. So these are two artworks about the guano industry, which is what I, the topic I started with today. The work on the left is by um, uh, two artists who are based in Puerto Rico, 
who call who are uh, call themselves Alora and Casadilla, which is a kind of mashup of their two last names. Um, and it's very recent work from 2020. And this is a work that's actually made of guano um, that is cast with resin into this sculptural form. You can see here just how you know really monumental sculpture. And you can look at the title, which is Manifest, and guess that it has something to do with shipping, because manifest means uh, is the statement of, a, of the cargo of a ship. Um, so this, in fact, is the, a casting, uh, a replica of the engine of ships that are operated by Crowley, which is the main shipping company that brings foods and goods to Puerto Rico. One of the things we should, you, should, you should know, and most people don't, is that the history of imperialism in Puerto Rico has, you know, has led to a number of laws related to shipping. And one of them is that goods have to arrive on American ships in order to be imported into Puerto Rico. They cannot come from other ships from other countries. So this gives the United States this power over people who live in Puerto Rico. Um, so this is a work that's about the ongoing colonialism in Puerto Rico, right? And it, but it ties that ongoing colonialism to the history of the Guano Islands Act because it uses guano as a material. Um, and you know, thinks about that relationship, not just for Puerto Rico, but for all diff many, many islands around the world. And if you compare it to the Whistler, you know, it's very striking because I talked about how Whistler was trying to hide that history, you know, mask it in this like cover of night. Um, and in contrast, Alora and Calzadilla are trying to forefront this guano, this history of guano, by actually making that, it, uh, using that as a material in their work. And it would, and actually it, this material makes the gallery really stinky, um, as you expect it would. So it's really confronting the viewer. So the same artist group has some amazing works about imperialism. It really is at the center of their practice and they're very generative for classroom discussion. This is a, an example um, of a work called Armed Freedom Lying on a Sunbed. And I just love this piece. So this is a, what you see in the sunbed, the tanning bed, is a replica of the sculpture that's actually in the top of the US Capitol building. Um, and that sculpture was installed in 1863. Uh, it represents freedom, but you can see that it's actually wearing this headdress that is supposed to be vaguely Native American. Um, so it's this like appropriation of Native culture to symbolize what America, you know, wants to be. And these artists are today, you know, in this in this new artwork are subverting that intended message of the original sculpture by debasing it, you know, turning it on its side and then putting it in a tanning bed to kind of relate that history to, you know, the way that Americans view the tropics today. So I, I think I have time for just one more artwork. Um, and that is uh, this piece, um, the polar bear on the left by Nicholas Galanin, a, a, Native, a, a Native Alaskan artist called We Dreamt Death. And you can see it's a taxidermy polar bear um, that's half stuck. So the front looks like it's rising, you know, becoming alive, and the back looks like it's a rug. Uh, and this is a bear that was killed by a white sport hunter in uh, the 1970s in Shishmaref, Alaska, which is a, a Inupiat village that's now very much in danger as a result of rising sea levels. So this work is really, um, it really speaks to this idea of survival. So, you know, part of the animal is rising from the dead, but it's also about this notion of colonial trespass, about, you know, the, the, the consequences of that history of, you know, settlers in Alaska. And you can see that kind of in the back, the way that like the back is flattened into this like commodity. Um, and I like to put it next to the Trump Loy painting because we see a lot of connections that both these artists are thinking about taxidermy and they're both thinking about taxidermy as this emblem of colonialism and the display of the way that Americans have understood animals and also people from other parts of the world. Um, and Glennon's work, I think, is thinking about that long history of colonialism in Alaska, and but he's introducing this factor of climate change into that conversation as well. Um, you know, thinking about 
uh, how um, white settlers came into Alaska and, you know, hunted these colonial trophies, essentially these bears, but also thinking about the future of what indigenous communities are now facing. So there are so many contemporary artists now who are making really exciting work that's about sort of decolonizing anti-colonial um, works of art. And I think that it's really often um, a great way of introducing students to a really difficult topic. Um, so, you know, some of these examples I've shown have been about pretty serious subjects, right? But they're also really accessible. So there's a kind of like literalness and they make an impression. Sometimes they're humorous. So um, I think they're a really memorable way of starting conversations about uh, the history of U.S. imperialism, which is often, you know, unacknowledged and ignored. So that's what I have for you today. Um, I'm welcome questions. Thanks for listening. And thank you so so very much. Uh, we truly appreciate you. Um, we appreciate all the comments in the chat. Uh, I read out one from Martin, and uh, Martin's at TA tonight. But Martin, thank you so much for this observation. He he mentioned, and this is just a statement. This is really interesting because it harkens back to the intertwined roots of enlightenment. And the chat is moving. Everyone is saying thank you. So I'm having a difficult time following along with it here as the comments are coming in. I apologize for that. Um, I'll come back to that. But uh, to shift gears to a question Martin has, his question is, I wonder if the so-called academic art, where academic authorities and juries decided what was and wasn't beautiful, doesn't go hand in hand with the imperial project and mindset. Another parallel between the art at this time, not just subject matter, but the political context in which art was judged and evaluated, if there's time. So his observation is, is I wonder if the so-called academic art where academic authorities and juries decided what was and wasn't beautiful doesn't go hand in hand with the imperial project and mindset. Sure, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it often, it often does. So for example, in the in the Civil War period, when the when Church was painting those landscapes, for instance, right, that was what would be considered academic painting uh, in that period for the United States, and it certainly you know ties into um, the state's desire for creating institutions that would um, project an image of the U.S as a kind of imperial power, or at least not, if not imperial, then at least a, a global power. Um, so for instance, I talked about plants, right? And the way that the tropics were being uh, represented and the way that plants were being collected. This is the same time that church is painting landscapes like that. The U.S. is establishing its first botanical gardens in Washington, D.C. So there's a lot of parallels between, you know, what's academic and what's sort of considered ideal art of the time and what the government is doing to, um, you know, establish cultural institutions. All right. Thank you. And there was a question earlier from Benjamin that uh, got lost in our chat somewhere here. Uh, but it was uh, initially when you, uh, you projected the image of the homage to a parrot. And uh, Benjamin mentioned the parallel between the parrot and the colonized people resonates. But do you think this was an intentional metaphor by the audience? I believe you addressed this a little bit, but uh, Benjamin, I wanted to go back into our list of questions and to be sure to respond to your, uh, to your, to your question and read it out. The parallel between the sure. parrot and the colonized people resonates. Yeah, I, I, I actually, my, from, like personally, I think it is intentional. Um, but, you know, that's my reading. I can't say, you know, the artist wrote it down, right? Um, but you know, there's another painting that he did, which actually represents, um, it's called the Irish question, and it represents these potatoes that are hanging from strings, and it's really evocative of the, the, this debate going on about Irish independence at the time, and um, there was a lot of discussion about that in the media, and the painting clearly references that. Um, and there's evidence to suggest that 
painters of this type of art called trompe l'oeil were, you know, generally, we don't know about Evans in particular, but generally they were middle class. They were, um, you know, uh, interested, you know, their work was very popular with a kind of like mass mainstream, you know, they weren't elite, you know, the collectors weren't elite. And so, um, and there was a lot of general support for Irish independence from that class because a lot of Irish immigrants in the United States were in that class. And so in that case, I kind of feel like, well, he, this artist seems to be sympathetic to that cause. And that's why I feel like maybe you could also read the parrot in that way. Awesome, this has been fantastic. Thank you so very much. If you will take a look at the audience chat, you will see everyone who is, uh, thank you for this evening. And I will tell you that I am uh, I'm looking at the uh, photo of the polar bear, the images of the polar bear. We dreamt of death, and that one's really kind of resonating with me as I'm looking at that. And thank you so much for, for, for sharing that. And for the teachers who have, have been here tonight, taking time out of your schedules. And uh, just, uh, Dr. Child, thank you for sharing your expertise with us all, uh, providing our teachers with approaches to bring in this idea of empire into their teaching of U.S. history and culture uh, by mobilizing art as a productive lens. And so it's been so very, very helpful. Um, and again, thank you to Martin Caver for your service on the Teacher Advisory Council. Uh, you've been very, very active in the chat tonight and uh, asking questions and uh, keeping the conversation moving along. So just know that we truly appreciate you and I look forward to continuing to work with you. I encourage everyone to keep up with what's happening at the National Humanities Center through our various social media feeds to get updates on our activities, ongoing activities. Uh, I'd invite you all to check out our next webinar, which is scheduled for May 2nd. Uh, again, as I said earlier tonight, we have two more webinars. So that will uh, conclude our season uh, after May 4th, but the next one, May 2nd, 7 o'clock p.m., A Revolutionary History of the Middle East with Nagme Sarabi, uh, Charles Corky Goodman, Professor of Middle East History at Brandeis University. And so we will be here and we'll be keeping an eye out for you. Thank you for joining us as always. And we hope to, to see you again during our Humanities in Class uh, online webinar series. Um, said a numerous time before, we truly appreciate you and the work that you are doing in the classroom. And if in any way I can ever assist with that great work, please do not hesitate to reach out to me directly at mwilliams at nationalhumanitycenter.org. Um, take care and be well. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>